Um, I mainly teach risk management related topics, so I do a risk management course that all our Master of Science students have to uh, go through. Um, I teach um, a course on risk modelling, which uh, not all, but a lot of our Master students voluntarily go through. Um, I'm also heavily involved in um, an executive program, master program in risk management and regulation that we've been offering for the last few years. I think we, the first intake was in 2010. Um, we developed the program with the Frankfurt Institute of Risk Management and Regulation here in Frankfurt. Um, and I've been involved in that program right from the beginning. I teach two courses in there, see a couple of familiar faces from the program too. Um, and that's essentially how I came about to, uh, uh, at some stage, say, well, we ought to get more into contact with the community, with professionals, um, and uh, roughly around about a year ago, uh, we got the academic partnership going with GARP to show that, or to signal that uh, what we're covering in our master programs is very much in line with what uh, risk professionals need to do and uh, uh, doing their certification. So uh, quite a few students, I think, are keen on taking the opportunity that as they study here, they have to put in some incremental effort, but it's not too much incremental effort in order to, uh, to do the uh, FRM exam. Um, so today I would like to speak a bit about um, um, a research project that I've been working on for the last couple of years with... Um, people from Deutsche Bank, with people from the University of Gießen. There's now a series of papers, and uh, there's, in particular, there's one overview paper that uh, is, has kind of uh, uh, the least technical, um, um, uh, or is the least technical, um, that you can, for example, download from my website, um, if you're interested in this. Um, other than that, I would like to um, encourage you, if there are any questions uh, going along, if you want to discuss, please raise your hand and uh, feel free at any time to interrupt me. Um, I do realise it's very kind that you uh, uh, mentioned me as the highlight, but I do realise the highlight is waiting out there and it's sort of me between you and the highlight. Um, Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, when I started doing the slides, I, 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 I noticed I was in a bit of a pickle because uh, I was asked by GARP to use their uh, design. I'm also asked by my school to use our design. And uh, even worse than that, because we only have a PowerPoint master, but I usually don't use PowerPoint. I have my own design too. So... <laughs> so um, I've kind of shown, I have three uh, title slides and then I think I'm, I'm done with the uh, corporate part and uh, we can start to speak about uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the interesting stuff. So before we look at the uh, contents, etc., cetera, let's, uh, 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 let's just talk about motivation and a brief overview of what we're doing here in this topic. I don't think that I have to explain to you what stress testing is about. Does everyone know what stress testing is about? I, 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 I'd be surprised to find a risk professional who nowadays doesn't know what risk, uh, uh, stress testing is about. Um, I do sometimes in, in, in the Master in Finance classes, we have lots of students who do corporate finance, who have very diverse backgrounds. I ask them, do you know anything about stress testing? They know nothing about it, but I would expect here yeah, everyone to be, probably most of you, who's, who's currently working in that area, who's who's being chased around by the e-bar. <laughs> okay. Well, um, very, very broadly said, a stress test is an assessment of the capital of a bank, so the risk capital or the regulatory capital of the bank, um, in a strongly adverse market environment. So we come up with some scenarios that are stressful but not too unrealistic and then the idea is to work out well what is the capital requirement under those conditions and I've just listed a couple of um, uh, uh, well more on the regulatory side regulatory um, uh, approaches to um, uh, we have uh, uh, extensive stress testing in the, in the basal requirements the European Banking Authority has been and is currently conducting stress tests in the euro area, and so on and so on. And um, 
uh, in terms of motivation and the need for stress testing, here are a couple of um, regulatory driven uh, uh, reports and documents that all uh, uh, agree that stress testing needs to be an integral part of risk management. So what do we do? We come up with some scenario and um, we uh, calculate things like expected loss, value of risk, economic capital, whatever your favorite risk measure is under these economic conditions. Now, one of the things uh, with stress tests, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but one of the things that uh, uh, I, at least, as far as I know, is uh, the case with stress tests. Stress tests are always conducted within models. You come up with a scenario, you feed that somehow into your model, and then you look at the output of the model. I don't know if there are any stress testing techniques that work outside of models, but, I mean, given the nature that we come up with artificial or with made up scenarios, there's usually no historical data or experience in that direction. So most of the time a model is involved. So um, a, a natural question could be, um, are there any model side effects from stress testing? How does, how does your model behave under stress? Do you know how your model behaves? Are you sure? Is it more of a black box? Um, that was basically how we started out on the topic. We were interested in um, finding out how do models, or how does a particular class of models behave under stress, and are there any kind of strange side effects? Let me give you an example of how we came, or how that topic came about. So, um, the person I'm working with on this uh, topic, Michael Kaltbrenner, he is the credit risk modeler at Deutsche Bank, and uh, when they were doing stress tests, developing their stress testing methodology, um, they saw some, observed some relatively strange things. Um, as anyone would expect, if you have a bad market environment, expected loss will shoot up. And that's what happened, perfectly okay. What happened with uh, value at risk? Value of risk went up too, of course, but it didn't go up in the way the modelers expected it to go up. It did go up, but not in the same degree as expected loss. Expected loss really shot up, and value of risk climbed up, but uh, it was kind of strange, and so they tried it with different portfolios, tried it with different scenarios, etc. It was always the same kind of stylized behavior. Expected loss would shoot up, and value of risk would, of course, go up, and, but not to the degree expected. So the question was, well, what's going on? And that was how we came about to um, talk about, or to, to look into this topic, trying to understand what was going on in their models. Okay, so what are the um, critical components? If we, if we kind of look at the, um, really the bare bones of a model, what are the critical components for for a credit portfolio, default probabilities, probabilities of default, PDs, as I've learnt <laughs> over the years, PDs, and as for any kind of portfolio, the absolute cornerstone of finance is all about diversification, concentration risk, it's dependency among portfolio components. Those would be the two very critical inputs, and then of course there are more inputs. Uh, but those would be the two critical inputs that we would suspect have a high impact on how risk measures and the stress behave. So uh, we would like to understand model behavior under stress, and we're going to look at uh, um, a model family that is more general but comprises a number of commonly used industry standard models, such as, for example, KMV. <coughs> Does everyone here know what KMV is, just to, just to find out? Who's never heard of KMV? I mean, we'll get there. Um, but uh, for, those, for those who know, you can just have K and B in the back of your mind as we, as we go along. We'll be a bit more general than K and B in those models. We'll be looking at a, at a, a class of distributions, so-called normal variance mixtures. Okay, so um, here's the overview of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. 
Uh, I'll very briefly say a couple of words about credit portfolio risk, the standard framework um, in which we model credit portfolio risk. And then I'll look at a particular type of uh, credit portfolio model, the Merton framework, and that's essentially uh, where KMV, for example, would fit in. Uh, we're going to generalize that framework um, to uh, um, uh, that framework was originally designed with normally distributed random variables, and we're going to extend that to so-called normal variance mixtures, and then we're going to look at the uh, stress testing methodology and uh, um, uh, our results. We're interested in particular in so-called asset correlations, how they behave under stress, and I'm going to tell you what asset correlations are. Uh, we're going to uh, um, look at default probabilities under stress, and we're going to look at default correlations under stress. And uh, if there's time left, uh, I have a, a, a small, simple study on uh, some risk measures, and then uh, I'll just briefly conclude. Um, now, this research uh, has been going on since 2009. There's now a series of papers, um, uh, most of them very mathematically oriented, but as, as I said, there's an overview paper um, I'll, I'll point that out to you at the end of the uh, talk. So if you're interested, uh, that would be a good uh, resource to, to maybe read up or read a couple, a bit more, go a bit more into detail. Okay, so simplest uh, credit portfolio model um, um, and uh, the standard, uh, as far as I know, is as follows. Um, in, in credit risk modeling, we typically we uh, take a very static view. We fix a time horizon and we don't worry so much about dynamics. We take a, t a time horizon. Credit risk would typically be one year. And uh, we're interested in uh, the losses from a credit risk position, so maybe a single loan, um, um, over that fixed time horizon. So that loss, denoted here by L, is essentially from, from today, since we don't know the loss in one year, is a random variable. And uh, it's typically broken down into three components, the so-called exposure at default. So uh, the, the, the value of your position, or the outstanding, the present value of the outstanding cash flows uh, at time of default. The loss given default, which is a percentage, quantifies the percentage of the exposure default that is actually lost. And what is not lost is being recovered. Usually when there's a default, there's some kind of recovery. Um, usually it de depends very much on the type of business. Depends on whether there's collateral, for example, or some other kind of residual value. And then there's a binary random variable, this bold one with a little d. It's a so-called default indicator takes the value 1 in case of default and 0 otherwise. So if it takes the value 1, then the loss is exposure time, uh, default times loss given default. If there's no default, then the loss variable is 0. This is essentially the simple model that uh, uh, people work with. Um, and we're mostly going to be interested in this guy here, this default indicator here, and we're most of the time going to ignore the other two. Um, depends very much on the, um, the, the kind of portfolio or positions that you're looking at. But in, in case of loan portfolio, we can usually assume those guys to be known, deterministic, or maybe even constant. Um, so what is the probability of default? Well, it's just the probability that this variable takes value 1, so it's the expectation of the default indicator. And in the case of a portfolio, we have our individual positions, which just sum up the individual losses to give us the portfolio loss. And what are typical measures used in credit risk? The expected loss, which is just the expectation uh, over the loss variable, the portfolio loss variable. And if we take exposure default and loss given default to be constant or deterministic, then this is in fact just the sum of uh, these individual uh, losses multiplied by the uh, probability of default. And this is the quantity that uh, usually banks need to, when they give out loans, they need to provision for that. Okay, so this is something, a quantity that needs to be earned by the business um, uh, in, the, 
in, ter in, in terms of some interest rate spread or something like that. Um, another risk measure is the so-called valued risk. Sometimes people speak of unexpected losses to differentiate from expected losses. Has anyone not heard of valued risk? So what is valued risk? So in valued, with valued risk, we try to express something like a high loss. The idea is essentially as follows. We specify some probability alpha. 99%, for example, would be a typical uh, um, level in market risk or 99.95% in credit risk. And now we're interested in knowing the loss amount, the loss amount, the smallest loss amount that will not be exceeded with that probability. And only with a probability of 1 minus alpha, so for example 0.05%, the loss is going to be greater than that number. So valued risk is a number in euros. So it's a loss value in euros. And it basically splits losses into two to groups, uh, those losses occurring with a probability smaller than alpha and those losses with a probability greater than alpha, the bad losses, the high losses. Now, um, expected shortfall is another risk measure which tells us something about the loss given that we have a high loss, so a loss greater than valued risk. It tells us of how bad that loss is going to be at least an expectation. Um, and then a quantity that used to be um, uh, um, important in some banks, but I'm, I'm learning it's becoming less and less important as economic capital. Um, but we could probably just replace it with regulatory capital. This is the difference between valued risk and expected loss. And this is, for example, if it was regulatory capital, could be some base input that, uh, from which we could derive a capital requirement. So we have something that we need to provision for, and we have something that we need to have hold some risk that we need to hold capital. For. Does anyone still work with economic capital? Okay. Okay. Well, may I ask which institution that is? Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank. Okay. 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 I know they have an economic capital model. Um, the only bank that I know that still uses economic capital um, for, 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 for steering, for, for making portfolio decisions, etc., is BMW Financial Services, and the reason is they, they don't have a problem with regulatory capital. They have, they have enough capital. Okay, so they do, they do real, true risk management in terms of they use risk management for making strategic decisions. Um, I think most banks uh, um, right now trying to secure uh, regulatory capital or offload risk-weighted assets. So here's a little picture that is probably in this form or another form familiar to some or most of you. Um, sketching what I just said, so here we have the portfolio loss, a variable that as of today is unknown. We assume, bold assumption, but we assume we can attach a probability distribution to it. So here sketched in terms of a density. And then we can look at the expected loss. This is what needs to be provisioned for. And then we have this region here, economic capital. So uh, kind of the difference between some loss amount that occurs only with a small probability and expected loss. And then here, those, are, those losses are not covered neither by provisioning or by some capital requirement. Okay, so how do we go about modeling those quantities? And in particular, uh, that's uh, maybe an important thing I ought to say here. I mean, this portfolio loss distribution, we're going to see a couple of examples in, the, in a couple of minutes. The shape of this probability loss distribution, in particular, then the location of this valued risk figure depends very much on the degree of concentration risk or the degree of diversification of the portfolio. So critical critical quantities for determining this distribution are the individual default probabilities and some kind of correlations or dependence uh, 
figures um, from which we can come up with a uniform distribution. One way of doing that is the so-called Merton framework of firm value model, asset value model. Um, I know this is part of the FRM. <laughs> so uh, those of you planning to do the FRM, uh, it's really worth uh, uh, listening now. That will save you maybe two or three hours um, uh, study time. So what is the firm value model? Uh, firm value model goes back to Robert Merton in 1974. And uh, the, uh, the, the principal idea of the firm value model is to, um, uh, to link uh, credit risk with equity markets. I think, I think the principal idea that uh, people had in mind was that we have very little data when it comes to credit risk. We have a lot of data from equity markets. So maybe there's a clever way of making use of that data and uh, doing some credit risk calculations. And the way to do it is as follows. We, have, uh, we look at the balance sheet of a firm, so it's assets and liabilities, and in this case, this is a kind of very stylized firm. In this case, uh, the balance sheet is very simple. The firm has some whatever assets, but they're very liquid. Um, it has debt and equity, and the debt consists of one single zero bond that matures at time capital T. Um, there are no intermediate cash flows, nothing whatsoever. At time capital T, the firm is unwound, so the assets are sold off. And then, depending on the value of the assets, the bondholders can get repay what they're owed, or they can't. So if they can get repaid, so if the value of the assets is greater than the outstanding debt value, then there's no problem, debt holders get repaid, their notion of amount, and the remainder goes to, uh, to the stockholders. If the value of the assets has dropped and uh, is now insufficient to repay debt holders, well, because of limited liability, there's no one to uh, compensate debt holders in that case. They just receive whatever uh, comes from the proceeds from the assets. And uh, well, the firm will be in default because it can't repay what it owes and uh, stockholders receive nothing. So this is the default event at time capital T, the firm value is below the face value of that bond. So this is a way of linking equity markets, all of the other market values, asset values with credit risk. And a very popular way of uh, modeling credit risk, um, uh, as we'll see. So how do we, how do we um, extend this to multivariate setting, to portfolio setting? And the idea would be, here in a simple single factor model, uh, would be to model asset returns, log returns in this case, so log returns of the asset value, typically assumed to be normally distributed in terms of some systematic factor that all assets are somehow linked to, and then something that is specific to firm I. So we have typically a normally distributed random variable um, as some kind of linear combination of something systematic and then something specific. And usually in practice, there would be more than one risk factor. There would be regions, industries, etc. There would be uh, a whole number of risk factors linking firms uh, with one and another. So this is a neat way of introducing uh, correlation, introducing dependence, because essentially it means if there's a shock to the systematic risk factor, then all asset values are affected, so there's a systematic event. Um, if there's a shock to one of those idiosyncratic factors, then it affects only firm I. It's as simple as that. And uh, uh, I've used here the notation R squared, which is a uh, um, kind of a notation I've often seen in, uh, being used in credit risk. Um, it, R squared denotes the correlation, and it's the R squared, if you're familiar with linear regression, it's the uh, coefficient of determination. And a lot of people in the industry use R squared, but it's really just correlation. So just take it as a correlation. Okay, so we call 
These correlations, we call them acid correlations because they are the correlations of the acid variables, the acid returns. Something that is much, much easier to observe in markets than default correlations. Dependencies in, uh, of, of, of defaults, very hard to observe. Acid correlation is something that we usually have data. Okay, so this is kind of the, uh, the principal idea of models like K and V or credit metrics, and it's essentially also this model that, in a slightly modified version, enters the um, so called Basel II formula for calculating the credit versus capital charge. So credit portfolio loss, it's uh, basically the uh, formula that we had before. So portfolio is always the sum of individual uh, loans. We have the exposure default multiplied with loss given default, and now multiplied with the default indicator, and default takes place, and that asset variable falls below some default threshold. Okay, so let's do a little example just to get some kind of feeling of what's going on and how asset correlations drive, uh, drive um, uh, the model. So what we're looking at here are loss distributions um, from a portfolio with 1,000 loans, and the loan characteristics are all identical. So um, each loan has an exposure default of one, loss given default of one, um, and a probability of default of 1%. So just think of a portfolio with 1,000 loans, each of them with a PPA <coughs> If they are uncorrelated, or in a normally distributed case, even independent, then what we get is, is a binomial distribution, which is, that is neatly centered around the expected loss. In, term, in, in case of 1,000 loans, the expected loss will be 10 loans, mm. will be 10. And that binomial distribution is neatly centered around that expected this is just a binomial distribution. The 99% value at risk is 18, which means with a probability of 99%, the loss um, is going to be, there, there are going to be 18 losses or below, or off here. 18 off here losses. And only with a probability of 1% are there going to be something between 19 and 1,000 losses. Which from a risk manager's point of view is kind of the ideal portfolio that you could have. Okay, so now let's tune up that asset correlation. And what we see as we, as we increase the asset correlation, what we see is the shape of the density changes. The expected loss will always be 10. Nothing changes here. But what we see is that probability mass, so the, the probability density that we have here gets pushed out into the tails, into the extreme event. So we see a much higher probability of seeing no defaults at all, or of seeing a high number of defaults. Okay, and this gets more and more extreme as we increase the acid correlation. And in the extreme case, where the acid correlation is one or nearly one, we have a two-point distribution. In the case of one, all loans behave like one loan. It's like one big loan. This is kind of the worst concentration risk that you can have. And what do we have in a correlation of one of all the loans behaving exactly the same way? We have a two-point discrete distribution. Either no loan defaults or all loans default. Okay, so this probability mass here gets pushed out really into, the, uh, in, into only two possible loss realizations in the extreme case. And we see how the value at risk increases. It goes up from 18, 76, 100 and 68, well that's 16.8% of the portfolio, that's okay, and then here 458, and then if we if we tune this up to one, then in fact the value of risk will be 1,000. So just to give you an idea of how crucial uh, dependence, how crucial correlation is in portfolio risk. So uh, now let me slowly move on to uh, what we did in, 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 in our research. So uh, we were interested in 
understanding, if we apply stress to such a model framework, and stress basically means we make some modification to that systematic variable. Um, I'll show you in a minute how exactly we do. Uh, we would like to know what happens to probabilities of default, what happens to correlations. Um, we're in fact interested in a bit more than just doing it for normally distributed variables. So uh, what we did, uh, we're looking at an extended framework and this extension called normal variance mixtures uh, works as follows. It's kind of, it's, it's one of the simplest way of, uh, of, of leaving the normally distributed world to something uh, uh, slightly more, um, more flexible. So we introduce one more random variable W, the so-called mixing variable. It's a strictly positive random variable, independent of everything else. And this one variable, so it's one scalar variable. It's not a vector or anything. It's just one variable. We multiply this variable uh, to each asset value. There we go. Just multiply this random variable to each asset value. And the way to think about it, and that would explain why it's called normal variance mixtures, the way to think about it, if this guy here is, let's say, standard normally distributed, everything is standardized, normally distributed, and we multiply a random variable onto this, then conditional on this random variable, conditionally we have a normal distribution of standard deviation W. If we already know the outcome of W, we, we have a normal distribution with a standard deviation of W or variance of W squared. So what we're doing is we're adding some kind of stochastic variance, stochastic uh, standard deviation to our normally distributed random variable, and this is what we call the normal variance mixture. We have a normal distribution, but now with a uh, um, uh, stochastic variance. Um, so um, our systematic risk factor would now be given by W times V. Again, these guys, they're, they're still normally distributed, nothing changes. But just multiplying this W on top, and the specific risk factor of risk would be W times A. And uh, well, what kind of distributions can we get? Well, if we choose W to be a constant, we just have a normal distribution. So the normal distribution is a special case of those normal variance mixtures. Probably best known to uh, to, to you would be the student T distribution. Is the student T distribution familiar? Yeah. Okay. Well, the student T distribution can be represented as a normal variance mixture. It's the product of a normally, normally distributed random variable multiplied with an inverse gamma distributed variable. It's just the way it is, but in particular, I mean, we can apply all of this in a multivariate framework, we can do that for all the assets here, and that gives rise to a multivariate student T distribution, and then for those of you who know what a copula is, to the student T copula. Student copula, T copula rises from a multivariate normal variance mixture. So there are a couple of well-known distributions that are all in this class of normal variance mixtures, so normally distributed random variables with a stochastic variance. And there's a, a, another, another nice thing that we uh, get from this class. It's, it's, it's in a way, it's a, it's a simple class because we're only extending the normal distribution with one random variable. Um, but what we get is a class containing um, both heavy tail distributions and light tail distributions. Now, who's heard of heavy tailed distributions before? Or who's heard the term heavy tail? Um, I mean, one of the one of the um, one of the critiques of the normal distribution is that it is light-tailed, which essentially means it is a model where extreme events are nearly impossible. So why do we use the normal distribution? Because it has a large number of other very very nice properties. But the main problem with the normal distribution is it doesn't fit financial data very well. If we look at financial data, if we look at the stylized facts of financial data, 
it turns out that normal distribution is not a good model. We see more extreme events happening than a normal distribution would suggest. On just a question here, yes. is it only in uh, 12 plus, or do you see the same thing? I mean, if you take out 2008, 2011, do you see it also in March? Oh, absolutely. If you take if you take uh, if you take a more or less arbitrary time series, stock data, um, um, commodities, etc. If you if, if if you do some kind of stati statistic or econometric analysis, you will find that the uh, normal distribution is not a very good model. Uh, well, and 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 even more grave or serious than that. Um, I mean, we see um, not only more extreme events um, in the data, we also see a lot of time variation in the parameters of the distribution. So the normal distribution, assuming that things are independent, identically distributed, normally distributed on top, is, is, is not a very good model. There's a very nice paper, in case you're interested, properties that we observe in financial time series. Um, and one property that we nearly never observe in financial time series is that the normal distribution is a good model. Yeah? Where's the advantage uh, of the various So, that, so why don't we take some, some specific distribution altogether? Okay, why don't we take some specific distribution altogether? Um, I mean, the, the, the normal variance mixtures are kind of moving one step away from the normal distribution. And the hope is that we manage to retain some of the nice properties of the normal distribution. What are nice properties of the normal distribution? A very nice property of the normal distribution is that dependencies are fully described by correlations. I don't have to mess around with some copula and a wild number of parameters. I need a correlation matrix, and that's a full description of the dependence. So the hope is that if we move to move just one step away from the normal distribution to something that is more realistic, that we retain some of these properties. And in particular for the normal variance mixtures, it is in fact the case that the correlation is still a good description of the dependence. So that's, that's certainly one of the reasons why people like to work with normal variance mixtures. We can still look at the correlation matrix and that describes the correlations of the asset variables. The dependence is a bit trickier, but it describes the correlations. Um, um, in, 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 and it, it, it is one of the parameters of the normal variance mixture model. Um, there, there are many things that we can do uh, in an analytic way that we may not be able to do with some specific distribution. It's still a symmetric distribution. I mean, nothing's changed in that respect. It's still some kind of bell shape, etc. It's just a bit more general. Okay. But the most important thing that uh, people feel they want to introduce is some notion of heavy tailedness, so some way of having more extreme events than, a, than in a normal distribution, and the normal variance mixture would be a very flexible, simple class, given you exactly that. Okay, so what does uh, heavy tailed mean? I'll try to, I'll try to put it in, in, in as simple terms as possible. When we talk about heavy tail, we talk about the tail of the distribution, so that's kind of the far end 
of the distribution of extreme events. Um, so we're going to look at this uh, tail function, which is just the probability distribution in the tail. We make that little variable x large, so we're going deeper and deeper into the tail. And now we look at, well, how does that tail function behave? It'll decay, but how fast does it decay? Does it decay slowly, like a polynomial? Or do, does it decay fast, like an exponential function? Okay. And if it decays slowly, and this is meant here by a power law, meaning it decays in some kind of polynomial sense of roughly x to the power of something, and this nu is a constant, then it is heavy tailed. Um, if the decay is exponential, so the exponential function e to the power of minus x is a very fast decaying function, then this tail uh, function is light tailed. And that fast decay, what, what does it mean? What does it express? It means as we zoom into the tail, there will be very little probability mass left okay, because it's all going away through that exponential decay. <coughs> Where does that parameter new come from? I always find it easiest to think in terms of the student t distribution because I know sort of, I know the few facts about the student t distribution. The student t distribution has one additional par parameter aside from some mean and variance parameter, and that's a parameter sometimes called degrees of freedom. And that parameter essentially specifies the heaviness of the tails. It's this new here. For the student t distribution, this is exactly. This is the degrees of freedom for the tail. And if nu is small, we have a very heavy tail distribution. And as nu approaches infinity, so as you make it larger and larger and larger and larger, um, we approach a normal distribution. So this nu here, this one parameter here, in terms of the special case of student distribution, is just the degrees of freedom parameter. Okay, so what we've done, we've just extended the class uh, uh, of distributions for our analysis to include some more appropriate models, heavy-tailed models in particular, um, <clears throat> and now it's time to go into the analysis. Okay, okay so uh, we have our model set up, we have our Merton framework where, where we model asset values uh, in the way just described. They, uh, we have a, a linear model in terms of uh, risk factor contributions and uh, specific contributions. Um, and now we would like to apply some stress to this model. Um, so something that obviously needs to be done but that I have no idea on how to do it is if we have some kind of stress scenario, uh, we'd like to translate that into somehow some constraints on the risk factor. I mean, somebody uh, uh, at each bank now in the Eurozone has to sit down, or at least I think it's the largest, 140 largest banks that are subject to uh, the current EBA stresses. So somebody has to sit down in the bank and think about, well, how am I going to translate that stress scenario into something that I can feed as an input into our model? Okay, I have no idea how to do that. That's not my, it's not my site. <laughs> um, so, but let's assume that uh, this step has been done in our set, uh, in our setup. And this is essentially what Deutsche Bank is doing, is uh, we formulate the stress scenario as a constraint on the risk factor. Remember V, let me go back to our model. This is our model, V, uh, sorry, sorry, that, uh, that is very unfortunate. V should be, uh, I guess, our model is a strength. So V is our risk factor, and it already follows the normal variance mixture distribution. V 
And this is the guy, this is the guy that we're going to stress. I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, I should have used X now. Okay. So this is the guy that we're going to stress. And by stress, we mean we just truncate that risk factor. We constrain it. Okay. Think of V as being, let's say, the DAX return. DAX return over some pre-specified um, uh, time horizon, and then if we choose C to be minus 0.1, it's like saying, in our stress scenario, the DAX falls by 10% or more. That would be the stress scenario. Okay, so uh, it means that we truncate the variable, we cut it off somewhere, and we constrain it to live in, a, uh, in a, um, uh, an area that's considered to be uh, stressful, and C we could think of C as being a number that uh, is associated with the severity of the stress. Okay. Uh, what are advantages of this kind of stress testing technique? Um, the stress testing technique that I'm, the alternative stress testing technique that I'm most familiar with is something that says, we'll, uh, we'll set V to equal to some specified value will set V equal to minus 10%. Instead of just saying it lives in that area of minus 10% or below. What is the advantage of uh, specifying it in this way? Well, in this way, we can in fact do everything in a uh, consistent way within the model. We can even attach a probability to this scenario. It's very hard to attach a probability to the DAX uh, ends up being exactly minus 10% in a year. That probability is zero. Okay. And then you can start with fudging, what's kind of roundabout. And blah, blah. This is something that we can usually attach a probability to, at least within our model. So it's a, it's a stress testing uh, methodology that's being used in, in, in some banks. Regulators have picked it up too. Um, for example, here, Klaus Dürmer, who used to be with, um, with uh, Bundesbank. Um, and, uh, and, and we uh, stick to this technique here. So our model ends up being we have a random vector, normally a variance mixture distributed, a common risk factor, and then uh, the individual variables. We apply stress by truncating that systematic factor V, and that basically means we'll be working under conditional distribution. Our new model is just a conditional distribution. It's just everything now, all probabilities, everything is now in terms of conditioned on B being less than or equal to C. That's the stress. That's the model under stress. And the hope is that in this way we'll be able to do some extensive calculations. Okay, so um, what we did in a series of papers, uh, for example, we looked at acid correlations under stress. So we look at the acid correlations, uh, when that risk factor is truncated. Uh, we've got some closed formulas for um, normal and t-distributions. And for the general normal variance mixtures, we have a formula for the uh, conditional correlation in the limit, okay. which from a mathematical point of view is kind of a very natural thing to do for everyone else. It always looks a bit funny, like kind of, what does that mean? You do it in the limit. But it turns out in mathematics there are many things that you can do by taking limits, um, and that's still very valuable information. Similarly, for conditional default probabilities, we have closed formulas in the limit, joint default probability, and also for default correlation. So we get some kind of idea of what's going on in the model when we apply severe stress to it, what our model affects, um, because we can, with closed formulas, just explicitly calculate those. And let's look at an example to get a bit of a feeling for it. Let's look at acid correlation. Let's do a little example. So we have two acids, A1 and A2. Um, they are correlated through some joint risk factor. Um, and if we look at a scatter plot, I mean, they do look somehow correlated. Is that, is that obvious to everyone yeah. that they are correlated? They, they, it's not just a random scatter plot. There seems to be some kind of um, similar behavior. And uh, if, we, if we plot a regression line, here it is. We see it has a slope of around about um, 0 0.4. Uh, 
correlation to amines. Now we apply some stress, meaning we truncate that common risk factor, and we do it in a way that we say, well, we want a stress scenario <coughs> that occurs with a probability of 10%. So probability that V is minus 1.28 or below is 10%. So this is how we determine C. And now we just filter out all the samples from this big sample. I think these are 5,000. We filter out all of those where this condition is met. And this is what remains. These are the samples that remain. Uh, shouldn't be a surprise. There's not much going on up here. We do see everything's kind of concentrated here on this lower uh, quadrant here, so this is uh, effectively the, uh, the, the stress applied. But another thing that we see if we look at it closely is, is that now this looks much more uncorrelated. And if we, if we calculate the uh, correlation of that sample, it's around about 0.1. So we've moved from 0 0.4 to 0 0.1 just by through our stress, in, uh, specifying our stress event. So it's conditional acid correlation has moved down to 10%. And why is that intuitively? Intuitively, why is that? Let's for a moment, let's put an equal sign here. Let's say we define our stress event, we set V equal to a number. So V is not a random variable anymore, it's now just a number. What happens if we set it to just a number? There's no more correlation then entering the asset variables through, through that number. The only correlation now that remains must be from some other risk factors or whatever. But we've effectively, if we set this to an equals, we've taken out the joint effect from that variable and that obviously will decorrelate those two variables. And we see a similar effect if we just constrain it instead of setting it to equal C. We see that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, um, there's a decorrelating effect. So that could be an explanation for that uh, puzzle I mentioned in the beginning. Um, for our original motivation, we, uh, we saw expected loss shoot up. Well, expected loss has very little to do with dependencies and correlations. And we didn't see value of risk shoot up in the same way because, well, I mean, it does go up through the uh, stress event, but there's, a, there's an effect that pushes it down again, and that is that now the portfolio, at least in the model, is much nicer diversifying. Do you explain it in simpler terms? Uh, okay. Instead of yeah. just, just quantitatively talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, intuitively, uh, could you explain uh, what, mm -hmm. what you mean by saying that we just need to do minus one point two eight ten percent probability of let's say variable uh, being down to two percent? Do you explain it? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, so I mean, what we're doing is. Well, what we did in this example, we looked at 5,000 potential realization, joint realization of those variables. And now we filter out, out of those realizations, we filter out, out those. So we, what we did, we simulated three variables, A1, A2, and V, the risk factor. So we simulated V, and then based on this formula, so we simulated V, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and then we constructed A1. And now, from my 5,000 samples, I take all of those that meet this condition. So where V, that simulated value of V, is minus 1.28 or below. And because it's a stress probability of 10%, that should be roughly 10% of the sample. Okay, we should see roughly 500 samples here. Each point here is in this picture, too. It's just that 90% uh, of those guys don't fulfill this condition, so so we just look at the remaining samples, and then on that remaining sample we can do, we can calculate correlation coefficient, 
and we can look at the scatter plot, and what we see is obviously the correlation has gone down. That's just what happens inside the normally distributed model. It's nothing that was specified in the stress test. It's nothing that anyone has wanted. It's just a side effect of the normally distributed model. Mm. And why is that? Because, because the two variables, A1 and A2, their dependence is introduced by this variable here. But now if we kind of constrain this variable and make it more and more fixed and just a number, there's no more dependence introduced from there. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah? Yeah, that clarifies why when you said P equals to minus one point eight, why we want to Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does uh, this really resemble the intuition of the market? I mean, I thought that the, in the crisis, okay. the correlation goes up. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean, what we see in crisis, if we look at correlation over time, if we look at the dynamics of correlation over time, we see usually in crisis times that correlations go up, which is not good from a portfolio point of view because the first, the, the, the idea to diversify was to have some kind of risk management for bad times, and when you need it, it's gone. Um, what we're doing here is something quite different because we're conditioning. Okay, so we don't have a time series, we don't look at time dynamics, <coughs> so it's something different. But still, I mean, the, the, the question is absolutely valid. Is, is, that, is that really what we think it should be? Okay. I mean, so far, I mean, this is just an, an analysis, now we know what's going on. Okay, but uh, the next question is, well, is that really what we, what we want? Is that really the, uh, uh, do we think this is still a good model? Okay, so uh, what we did in, uh, in this paper here, we investigated those correlations under stress. We have some closed formulas for normal T distributions. They're just long and not very insightful, but they're there and you can tap them into your computer and then you get a number for fixed for, for, for fix C. Um, in the limit case, for the more general case, so not restricted to normal and t-distributions, but more generally, as we increase the stress, we get a closed formula. And again, not so much to be seen from that formula, except maybe the, the, the interesting thing is to um, look at the variables that enter, oops, and then to have a look at the plot. So the variables that enter are the correlations. This is the correlation of acid I with a risk factor correlation of acid J with the risk factor, the correlation among acids I and J, and this number nu, which you, if you remember in a T distribution was the degrees of freedom or which more generally describes the heaviness of the tails. So obviously depending on the heaviness of the tails, the effect on the correlation will be different. Okay, so let's take a quick look. What we see here, we have here the stress probability. So as we go to the right, we're applying more and more and more stress. The solid line is the uh, acid correlation um, in a normally distributed model. And as we saw before in the example, now we have the numbers, the exact numbers to back it. Um, this goes down to around about 10%, 0 0.1. Um, it does so too for a T distribution with degree of freedom 10 and 4, but on a sort of more moderate scale. The effect is not that pronounced. If we look at the uh, limit formula, so uh, this is now the uh, correlation in the limit as a function of the uh, tail index of that number nu. We see the more heavy tail the model, so the smaller that index nu, the less sensitive the acid correlation to stress, and the more the light, the lighter tail the model, normal distribution is here, to the more sensitive the model is to stress. And that would very well explain the effect, this initial effect in the uh, stress testing 
uh, um, uh, exercise from Deutsche Bank where they found expected loss shoots up, but valued risk goes up, but not to the ex degree expected. Because, of, of course, the stress pushes up, um, or, or, or pushes up the losses, but at the same time there's some diversification effect that should not be there. So that was part one. I'll speed up uh, uh, a bit. Um, we've done similar things now for default probabilities and default correlations, um, all going down to um, coming up with some closed formulas. Um, let's start with, um, again, just some intuitive pictures. If we look at default probabilities under stress, so we're looking at the probability that the acid variable A falls below the default threshold conditional on the risk factor being less than or equal C. Now, we, we don't need any new formulas for that. It's a conditional probability, and this can be expressed in terms of the B variant, the joint probability, and univariate probability. What we see in the normally distributed case, whatever the initial default probability, as we increase the stress, the C moves out here to the left, default becomes a sure event. Okay. So for light tape models, we'll see more generally, but in the normally distributed case, we'll see default is a sure event as we increase the stress. What about heavy tail models? What would you guess? Is default going to be a sure event? In the stress? This is now light tailed, now yeah, heavy tailed. Yeah. I mean, we had no clue when we started, we had absolutely no clue. Okay. And, uh, but there we go. Okay, T distributed case. There we go. Okay. We apply stress, we have chosen some parameter 5, which is kind of what you would expect from a typical equity time series. And what we see is. At least for large stress levels, it's well below one. It's well below one. Now, when you continue doing that, the numerics usually break down, so you have no clue. Is it going to converge to one eventually or not? Um, another exercise, we just vary that parameter new, so we move from more heavy tailed models to less heavy tailed models in C seems to be kind of converging to one, but still, we, we don't exactly know what's going on. What's, we don't know what's going on kind of beyond here. Um, so we've got some closed formulas for that. Um, in the light-tailed case, default probabilities, univariate, multivariate, whatever, everything is one. In the heavy-tailed case, no, no. Uh, default probabilities are strictly smaller than one. Default is not a sure event. Neither in the univariate case nor in the bivariate case or even in the um, general case. The formulas, they, they're kind of long and uh, convoluted, but again, I mean, you can just tap this into some software and you get some concrete numbers. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see that's uh, kind of counterintuitive to what we're used to. It's kind of interesting to see that now the light-tailed model reacts much stronger to stress and default is a sure event, whereas for the heavy-tailed model, it's not. We're, we're, we're used to thinking in terms of, well, heavy-tailed models kind of uh, allow for more extreme events, etc., etc., but now we see kind of something slightly different. When we go to realistic stress levels, uh, here we compare normal distribution with T-distributions, stress probability, we see that for more realistic stress events, it's still the T distribution uh, kind of has higher probabilities of default. So applying the same stress has a stronger effect on the T distribution. But for extreme events, that basically turns around. Something similar for default correlations, uh, similar, quite similar to the acid correlation case, 
Um, in the light tail case, default correlations vanish, they become zero. And in the heavy tail case, they're strictly greater than zero. So we have again some result in that direction. Um, I think the, 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 the important things maybe to bear in mind is that uh, acid correlations have this kind of effect. The more light tailed the model, the, the more sensitive stress or the, more, the stronger the effect of stress on correlations, on the dependent structure. Um, so let me just finish with a very quick uh, 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 case study to get some kind of idea of uh, how things behave on uh, when we look at value of risk. So we look at a portfolio with 60 counterparties, homogeneous portfolio, equally weighted, etc. PD of each counterparty 1%, and some correlations between the counterparties. Um, and now we look at that portfolio under three different distribution assumptions, normally distributed, and two T distributions, kind of lighter tailed and more heavy tailed. Um, and we look at the value of risk at a 99% level for different stress levels. So we stress, we apply stress, and then we calculate a 99% bar. Okay. Um, for different stress levels, we do this. And what we see is that value at risk in the normally distributed model, although it ends up being in, 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 in the extreme case, the greatest figure because default is a sure event. All assets will default, so the value at risk will just be the um, uh, one, 100% of the portfolio. But we see for most of the time, in particular for realistic stress levels, the value at risk is smaller than in more heavy tailed models, although here this converges to smaller numbers. Okay, so let me wrap up. Uh, what we do is we look at model behavior under stress for, in, uh, for credit portfolio models. Um, this started off with a, a puzzling effect um, that uh, um, was seen when just calculating uh, uh, risk measures. And so the question came up, well, can we explain this? Can we, do we know where this comes from? Um, and uh, what we did is, well, we did a lot of mathematics to, in fact, come up with some very uh, 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 strong results in, in terms of closed formulas proving, yes, there is an effect on the asset correlation, there's an effect on default probabilities, there's an effect on default correlations, and we now know very well how, what, what this effect looks like. And uh, very loosely speaking, light tailed models are more sensitive to Acid correlations, acid correlations typically going down as we apply more stress, and heavy tailed models are less sensitive. Default probabilities under stress uh, in light tailed models uh, converge to one. They don't in heavy tailed models. Default correlations converge to zero in light tailed, and to something greater than zero in, uh, in heavy tailed models. And for realistic stress levels, one really has to closely look at things. Um, there's kind of a point where, where things flip around. Okay, so... Um, I'm just questioning this. Yeah. So what do you mean to say that it's a paradox? And if we can explain. Well, I would say it's... We, we now understand where... Uh, how models behave. We understand better how models behave under stress testing. And now the question is, well, is that something that's acceptable? Is that something... Should we change the model or whatever? There, there is, a, at, least, at least from our point of view, there is no sound economic explanation. It's a, it's a pure model effect. I, I, don't have, I don't have an e economic expectation. So, because you asked for intuition earlier. I don't have an economic expectation. I don't have, I don't have a good economic explanation of why this should be. And I don't think in economic terms that it should be like that. It's just, it's a pure model side effect. That would be my conclusion. So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. so what you mean to say is that banks could use this use this knowledge what you get from here and just um, use a um, model that will result in the 
one in favor of them, um, one result in favor of them than the other, or something like that? Okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. I mean, what, okay, okay, I mean, what could um, banks do now? What could banks do now? Um, as far as I know, one of the things that has been discussed at Deutsche Bank was, in fact, to, um, <coughs> no, let's stay here, um, be, uh, was to discuss that because heavy-tailed models are less sensitive, to maybe switch to heavy-tailed models. For example, yeah, to not to not have this undesired effect. I mean, it's it's from a regulatory perspective. I mean, it's 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 better to kind of maybe think in terms of um, uh, uh, stick to normally distributed models. If you if, if if you tend to think in terms of that this is a penalty, you would stick to a normally distributed model. But if you want to do something that is maybe more realistic or mean, meaningful, then uh, definitely. I mean, it would make sense to, to switch to a more heavy tail for several reasons, and this is one of them. Is it hard to understand the measure of heaviness of tail mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. new, is mm -hmm. high? When uh, asymptotically, suppose we increase new mm -hmm. and make tail more heavy, mm -hmm. when uh, we are done with a uniform distribution, is high? If we increase okay. tail mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. asymptotically mm -hmm. to, to the limit, when okay. we have a uniform distribution, is it correct or not? Um, so the, this parameter nu, the way to think about it is small nu are heavy-tailed models. So heavy-tailed model, very heavy-tailed model would be a model with the parameter 2. would be a very heavy-tailed model. There's a lot of probability mass out in the tails and very little in the center. And now, as you increase new, as you increase the parameter, the normal var variance mixture distribution converges to a normal distribution. Yeah, but, but the intuition, if I increase mm -hmm. tail, mm -hmm. when uh, I lose the tail mm -hmm. shape, and then ah, finally I have okay. a uniform distribution, okay. when I do okay. not need to make the stress, okay. because nothing to stress. Okay. I think the, the uniform distribution, okay, the uniform distribution is the uh, opposite of the heavy tail distribution. Mm -hmm. This is a so-called short tail distribution because it's bounded. So heavy tail basically means heavy tail basically means that that was a normal distribution and heavy tail would mean that you have more something like this. Okay? You make it flatter and flatter yeah. but I mean it still extends here to infinity on the mm -hmm. even side. Um, whereas a uniform distribution is bounded and this is something like this. Okay? That would be the short tail Heavy tail, light tail, and short tail is the kind of the other extreme. Okay, so, um, so that would be another class that we usually in finance kind of ignore. That certainly other applications where that plays a role. But in, in finance, we very seldom have a, a, a bounded random variables. So, um, so I didn't mention that one, but uh, that would be in the third case a short tail. So why don't we use the kurtosis? So kurtosis is the fourth moment. Okay, so we have mean, variance, skew, and then kurtosis. And kurtosis is kind of a measure of distance to the mean. But now everything is uh, uh, to the power of four. So uh, long distances to the mean have a very high value, very high penalty. So kurtosis, from that perspective, uh, relative to the kurtosis of the normal distribution, is can be considered as a measure of heaviness of the tails. Um, sometimes called excess kurtosis if you do it relative to a normal distribution. So the question is why don't we use kurtosis? Um, this kind of classification with the tail index, um, um, I'm just, just wondering if there's a natural link to the kurtosis, but I'm probably not. This uh, classification with the tail index and this classification of heavy tail, light tail, short tailed is something that um, is really a result from directly going into the tail and ignoring everything else that's going on. If you remember, we have this power.
power law behavior as we zoom further and further into the tail. Um, we have a kind of type of uh, decay behavior in that tail function. And this is a classification that's been used um, um, in mathematics uh, now for a long time in a field called extreme value theory, which is specifically about extreme events. And that seems to be uh, the, the best classification in some respects. So there, there are slightly different definitions of heavy tailed around too, but the, that seems to be the best classification in terms of, um, of, of structuring things into groups where you have kind of results on heavy tailed and light tailed, etc. Um, values. So again, those, I think, who do the FRM, they've at least heard extreme value theory before, the term, and this is kind of the uh, classification from extreme value theory. So for, 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 for mathematicians, this is more natural, but if, if you've done more statistics, then of course the fourth moment is a very natural thing to look at. But uh, there, there's a close connection of course, between cortosis and uh, um, having heaviness of tails. Yeah? Uh, when you had this puzzling effect with the Deutsche Bank model, uh, you, you use the same uh, conditional stress that is uh, the, the uh, mm -hmm. risk factor had to go beyond the uh, certain limit. Mm -hmm. Because it's then the risk factor the follows the In my view, uh, stress would be more uh, like, a, like a shift of the uh, mean value of the uh, mm -hmm. risk factor distribution mm -hmm. to, to some new value, at least for a certain okay. time. Okay, okay, okay. And then you okay. have uh, maybe okay. this an even uh, mm -hmm. increase of volatility of these mm -hmm. risk factors, and okay. then you get maybe other effects of Okay, so what you're saying is what you're saying is, well, I mean, what we're doing Under the stress event, this is now the distribution of V. And what you're saying is, well, why don't you do the following? That is your variable V. You shift the distribution. And here's maybe the stress event in C. So you just take the whole distribution and shift it to the mean of C. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're then, then uh, Whereas here you actually make a change to your model. And if you would only move this graph to the left, it would uh, decrease the quality of your portfolio and your expectation would shift. But it would mean you are worse invested than in the other case, economically. But it would not uh, have any effect on your value at risk expectation, just that it's parallel shift. But the extraordinary cases are the extreme cases in the other ends and not the mass. Of the probability, so it wouldn't help to shift it. Still have the same outcome, but shift it with the expected value. And you really need to research the tail end to really see what the heavy tail really means instead of the, the, the light tail. So that could be maybe an economic. This model is being tested as a test uh, to uh, validate the reality. Oh, okay. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I would have. I, I would have to find.
find out. Um, I don't know. I don't know to what. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in the practicalities of stress testing. Uh, there are probably uh, 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 people in the audience who know much more about practical stress testing than me. Um, I would assume that it's hard to back test a stress test because it's a rare, by definition, a rare and unusual scenario. So I don't know. Good timing. <laughs> um, but so, I don't, if, if, if anyone else has a comment in that direction, because uh, I mean that's an interesting question. Does anyone have experience back testing? Okay, so um, maybe just very last few words. So uh, this is. This is the one paper that I mentioned earlier. It's, it's, it's only 12 pages, and it's kind of an overview paper of what we've done with uh, the least technical fuss. So it's kind of more directed at professionals rather than <coughs> mathematicians. Um, so that, if, if you're interested, uh, uh, you would find it on my webpage. And other than that, I thank you very, very much uh, for being here, for listening, for your comments, questions. Um, uh, I, I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss uh, um, now after the official part or any other time. If you, if you have any more input, just drop me a line, send me an email. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention is, since we have a couple of risk-related programs here, um, I've put out a couple of brochures and stuff. If you're interested uh, in anything related to that, feel free to let me know, drop me a line, uh, take along a long brochure. And, uh, well, I wish you uh, and all of us a nice rest of uh, the evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as already mentioned, uh, anyone who's interested in uh, finding a partner for study group uh, for the FRM ERP, just uh, feel free to come over and we uh, find a find a nice place at the reception outside uh, where we've got a, a small snack and, and wine and beer for you. So. We're Looking forward to uh, uh, discussing uh, with you some insights on that and uh, the FRM ERP. And thank you very much again for Frankfurt School for your uh, sharing some insights and, and research. <laughs> um, so I hope we'll see you again and uh, have a good night. Thanks. Ja, denke ich, von der Fragestellung durchaus auch was, was jetzt ja, ja nicht nur die Leute machen. Ja, Vielen Dank. Ja. Jetzt muss ich. Jetzt haben wir natürlich unser. unser
Ähm, kleines äh, kleiner Dialog auch noch. 